Welcome back to the Fulton County Gospel News Podcast. My name is Barry O'Dell, and I am your host. Fulton County Gospel News is a bi-monthly publication of the Church of Christ in Mammoth Spring, Arkansas. And if you'd like to learn more about the paper, visit our website, mammothspringchurchofchrist.com, and you can find all the necessary information there. If you would like to receive the paper, you can receive it either as an individual through your email, you can receive an individual copy through the United States Postal Service, or you can receive a bundle of the papers, and then you can hand them out. All of that is free of charge. Again, just visit our site and get a hold of us, and we'll be happy to add you to our mail list. So I'm continuing to work my way through this article from the October 1983 edition of the paper entitled, What Must the Church Do to be Saved? And we've talked about the first point, develop elders who can convict the gainsayer. We talked about the second point on the last episode, train young men to boldly preach the gospel. And so today we're going to talk about point number three in this article, and it covers something that is extremely important, that is biblical, and that is perhaps, in I guess in my personal experience, one of the most neglected issues within the church. So here's point number three on what must the church do to be saved. Practice church discipline constantly and consistently. So I'll read the paragraph, and then I'll have my own comments. In order to preserve truth and strengthen the children of God, there must be, as the Bible directs, discipline within the body of Christ. When bishops of the local church allow the name of the Lord to be degraded and scoffed at by worldly, insincere members, it sets the church back for years. All right, so this is an extremely important topic. So the passage the author shared for us to read would be Hebrews 12, I'm not going to do that. I've got three passages that I want to look at that specifically address the practice of church discipline. And the first one is uh, Jesus' teaching as recorded in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15, so I'll start reading there. Now, in terms of church discipline, this passage, what this passage is dealing with initially is a matter that arises between two individuals, and that that is where it should die if it is handled correctly. So listen to Matthew 18, beginning in verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. So that's what I mean when I say it's an individual instance of offense, and it should die when it's handled properly. You go to that person alone. Verse 16. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses... Every word may be established. Okay, you don't want it to get out of hand. You don't want rumors to start. You don't want incorrect information to get out. So handle it properly. If your brother is not willing to listen, verse 17, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be like to let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now we understand when this teaching was done by Jesus, the church was not yet established. But the principle still applies. If you or if you sin against someone or if someone sins against you, it's to be handled in that way. So another passage that addresses this topic of an individual offending another individual is also found in Matthew chapter 5, but it's found uh, from the perspective of, okay, I'm the offender. Well, what do I do? So Matthew 5 and Matthew 18 deal with this concept of church discipline, but it starts off in a one-on-one. And if it's handled properly, if the one who is approached because of sin repents, it's done. It's settled. But if not, you may have to take it before the assembly. That's the language that Jesus uses there. Now, the second passage that I'm going to use, I'm going to turn my Bible over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is a very specific incident that took place in the church at Corinth. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It's not a very long chapter. It's only... Let's see here. It's only 13 verses long, but it's a very specific sin that was going on within Corinth. The first sin was that a man had his father's wife. Okay, they were committing fornication, a man probably with his stepmother. So that's sin number one, and it's rather obvious that you cannot inherit the kingdom of God if you're living in the sin of fornication. But another problem was that the church was not handling it. They were basically condoning the behavior. When you start reading in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, he tells the church, your glorying is not good. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. But here's what he tells them to do uh, in the case with this brother. 1 Corinthians 5 and beginning in verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay, so he appeals to the authority of Jesus, when you are gathered together, 
along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so in the public assembly, you call the sin out for what it is, and it's for the purpose of uh, the destruction of the flesh, that is, the, the, to, to bring that sin to a halt, that his soul may be saved. And so then again, he goes on to rebuke them for not having done that. But now listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with fornicators. Yet I certainly did not mean with fornicating people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Okay, so a Christian, a child of God, is surrounded by that type of behavior, uh, behavior on a regular basis. You can't do anything about that when it's in the world. But listen to this. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is fornicating, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. And then Paul gets so specific, he says, not even to eat with such a person. When a fellow Christian, when a child of God is in open rebellion to God, he's committed the what the Old Testament might refer to as a presumptuous sin. He's going to do it regardless. Your relationship with that person has to change. Don't even eat with them. Then he goes a little further with his instructions in verses 12 and 13. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do, do you not judge those who are on the inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves that evil person. And so he gets even more specific. Listen, what our job as the church is not to judge the world. Okay, God's going to handle that. Your job as the church is to handle the situation within the congregation. Handle it. Because if not, you're glorying in that sin and you're allowing the leaven, the influence of that individual, and really the influence of your inaction to affect everybody in the local congregation. And then a third passage that I want to address is found over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and it really starts in verse 6. So listen to this. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw... Listen to that. Now that goes right along with 1 Corinthians 5. You don't even eat with that person. So listen again. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw. Okay? To the, the Greek word there means to avoid or to shrink back from. You withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Well, what's he talking about, particularly in this context? Starting in verse 10, he says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner. All right, that's what he said back in verse 6. What are they doing? Not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and they eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person. Okay, so remember back in 1 Corinthians 5, when you are gathered together, you take this, let's say, disciplinary action. Well, here the instruction is, you note that person, you let it be known who this individual is who's walking disorderly, and do not keep company with him. There's the specific instruction. If one who is called a child of God is living in sin and will not repent, what is the faithful child of God to do? 1 Corinthians 5 says, don't even eat with them. 2 Thessalonians 3 says, you withdraw from them and you do not keep company with them. And here's the stated purpose of that action, that he may be ashamed. See, and I think that's part of the problem. You know, our our culture is so negative on shaming people. I mean, you can't shame anybody for anything. I mean, that's very judgmental and that's very harsh, so we can't do that. Well, we know that's we, we know that's not what God tells us to do. And so this command to withdraw or to shrink back from and not keep company with, that's harsh. That's difficult. But the stated goal is that they may be ashamed. Yet you don't count him as an enemy, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.15, but you admonish him as a brother. You don't mistreat him. You don't gossip about him. But when you have an opportunity, you admonish him as a brother. You want him to come back. 
See, here's the thing. You cannot be saved in your sin. You must be saved from your sin. And when we start talking about church discipline, you know, we understand the fact that no child of God is sinlessly perfect. But we are called to be holy. Uh, we are called to be faithful. We are called to shine as lights in the world. We're told in passages like Ephesians chapter 5 that there are things that are done that should not even be named among the children of God, things that are shameful. And certainly what we read about in 1 Corinthians 5, that is shameful, and it's hard to believe that that kind of behavior was going on in, a, in an apostolically established church in the first century, but it was, and Paul told them how to handle it. So what does the church need to do to be saved? It needs to practice church discipline constantly, and consistently. Now think about consistently. So I had a question someone asked me a while back, specifically in terms of church discipline. And the question was, do the requirements for church discipline apply to my family members? Yes. It, it, there are no exemptions from the commands to withdraw yourselves from those who walk disorderly. There's no exemption from the command of that you don't even eat with this one who calls himself a brother, yet who has gone off into sin. Now listen, what do these folks need? Well, they need to be ashamed of their sin, and they need to be restored. And so I think of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. In fact, let me turn over there real quick. Listen to Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. Well, what does it mean to restore such a one? It, it means you put a thing back in its rightful place. You restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, that's what our brothers and sisters who have gone off into sin need. They don't need us to treat them like nothing's changed. They don't need us to treat them like we approve of or condone their sinful behavior. Because that's not going to bring them to repentance. That's not going to produce the shame that's needed for a person to change. But again, I think in our very um, non-judgmental, non-shaming society, we, we've lost that even within the church. So church discipline needs to be practiced constantly and consistently. We need people who will preach the word boldly, and we need elders who, will, who are able uh, and willing to convict the gainsayers. So those are the first three points in this article. And listen, it's December 23rd. I'm not going to be recording for a few days. I hope you all have a Merry Christmas, and I appreciate you listening to the, to the Fulton County Gospel News podcast. If you have not yet subscribed to our Podbean channel, I would encourage you to do that. And when you do, you'll get notifications of a new episode that comes out, and you can interact with each individual episode. If you would like to get our paper, it's free of charge. Just visit our website and get a hold of us, and we'll be happy to add you to our mailing list. So I hope you have a good, uh, good day and a good holiday, and I'll catch you on the next episode of the Fulton County Gospel News Podcast.